think we, we everybody is waiting. Do you want my video on, right, or not? Off. Off. Okay. Oh, sorry, you, you, your video can be on. Yeah, sir, you can turn on your video. Yes. Okay. Okay, it's live. Okay, uh, we have three hundred seventy-eight already. Okay. Let us start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Focus Neo webinar series. I'm Dr. Gani from McMaster University and co-chair of Focus Neo. It's my pleasure to meet you all again at this wonderful afternoon. We hope you are all enjoying our webinar series from Focus Neo. You may have noticed now we have changed our webinar portal since many of you have complained about audio issues and technical difficulties with the WebEx uh, portal. We have moved to this new portal and we want your feedback and experience with this portal. You can see Q&A window or a chat window that you can switch to chat and Q&A and you can type your questions and our moderator will be able to see your questions and will be answered by the speaker. Now may I request Dr. Yasser El Said, who is our co-chair of Focus New and he is an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Manitoba, Winnipeg, to moderate this session and introduce our speaker. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ghani uh, Abdul Wahab. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ruben Alvaro, who is the medical director of uh, Neonatal Sleep Lab at the Health Sciences Center, uh, Winnipeg, the medical director of neonatology at St. Boniface General Hospital, and the associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Manitoba. Dr. Alvaro's neonatal provision activities have uh, encompassed education, research, administration, and the clinical care. His main research focus has been on control of breathing and respiratory care in the fetus and the, the neonate. He has also collaborated in many local and international randomized clinical trials for the last uh, 15 years, including the uh, CAT trial, the caffeine trial, and the Canadian oxygen trial and most of these trials in the area of respiratory medicine and family integrated care in NICU. Uh, welcome, Dr. Alvaro. It's our pleasure to have you today in one of the very interesting topics, um, basic pulmonary waveform graphics. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, the Pocos Neo organizers for um, allowing, uh, allowing me to uh, give this lecture uh, today. Uh, we're going to try to cover uh, the most basic uh, uh, things about uh, basic pulmonary waveform uh, graphics. I'm going to try to make it uh, very practical. Uh, so to start, I would say I have no conflict uh, of interest uh, to declare. The objective of my presentation today are first to identify graphic display options provided by mechanical ventilators, describe how to use graphics to more appropriately adjust the patient ventilator interface, and finally to illustrate uh, practical applications and uh, usefulness. Uh, as you know, uh, real-time pulmonary graphics have become the standard of care in most NICUs. Uh, most of the new generation of uh, mechanical ventilators uh, incorporate uh, proximal uh, airway sensors that are also refers as uh, transducers that are positioned between the ventilator circuit and the endotracheal tube. Now, these transducers are now very uh, small, very light, and introduce very minimal additional dead space. That's why they're, they're good and practical, okay? So the question is, uh, can we ventilate infants without using pulmonary graphics? And the question is, of course we can. Uh, we've done it for many, many years. Uh, but I tried to... Um, 
uh, make an analogy and compare poop ventilating babies using pulmonary graphics with uh, taking a hike on a trail. You can hike a trail using uh, a map, a good map, and a GPS, or you can hike that trail without a map or a GPS. And most likely, if you don't use a map or a GPS, you can get to the end of the trail, okay. But most likely, you're gonna spend uh, more time, uh, you may get lost, uh, and it's not gonna be as pleasant as if you were to do the same hike uh, with a good map and a good GPS. Uh, so you're not gonna get lost, and you are going to get to the, the end of the trail much faster, and uh, you're gonna enjoy that trail much better. So uh, that's a comparison that I do with uh, using uh, pulmonary graphics at the bedside when we uh, ventilate a baby. So uh, understanding pulmonary graphics um, allow us to provide a safer and a better care and will also enhance your clinical experience. And uh, when you get familiar with this uh, pulmonary graphic, you will see that uh, you, you will enjoy uh, looking after uh, babies on, on a ventilator, okay? So, um, the basic uh, things that we can obtain from using pulmonary graphics is uh, there are many things that uh, pulmonary graphics can help us with. First is we can confirm the type of uh, ventilator mode we're using. Uh, it can help us to detect auto PEEP. Will also help us to determine the patient ventilator synchrony. It will also assess and adjust trigger levels. It will also measure the work of breathing, adjust the volume, and minimize over distension. We can also assess the effect of treatment. We can detect uh, equipment malfunctions. Uh, we can also determine appropriate uh, levels of uh, PEEP that we are using. We can also assess uh, the adequacy of inspiratory time in pressure control ventilation. Uh, we can detect the presence and rate of continuous Hi everyone, they just uh, there is a technical issue, so we re restart again. We are going to restart again. Gany, can you restart again? Hi everybody. Um, fix at the bedside when we uh, ventilate a baby. So uh, understanding pulmonary graphics um, allow us to provide a safer and a better care and will also enhance your clinical experience. And uh, when you get familiar with this uh, pulmonary graphic, you will see that uh, you, you will enjoy uh, looking after uh, babies on, on a ventilator, okay? So, um, the basic uh, things that we can obtain from using pulmonary graphics is uh, there are many things that uh, pulmonary graphics can help us with. First is we can confirm the type of uh, ventilator mode we are using. Uh, it can help us to detect out of PEEP. Will also help us to determine the patient ventilator synchrony. It will also assess and adjust trigger levels. It will also measure the work of breathing, adjust the volume, and minimize over distension. We can also assess the effect of treatment. We can detect uh, equipment malfunctions. Uh, we can also determine appropriate uh, levels of uh, PEEP that we are using. We can also assess uh, the adequacy. Um, I'm extremely sorry that uh, this new portal has a, a different functionality. Um, uh, Ruben, can you please, um, you know, start your presentation from from your screen, because um, from the portal there is some issue is coming, like uh, there are some play, like, you know, some technical errors are coming. Ruben? Uh, 
can you click on the slides and you can start the presentation by moving okay by next button can you can you can you switch on your mic please I can't hear you. Uh, Ruben, I, I can't hear you. Turn on your, turn on your mic. Ruben. Can you hear me, uh, Gani? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so he can present from my uh, from my computer. Yeah. Yeah, come over to my office, please. Yeah, yeah, because that's what I think is okay. <clears throat> you can adjust it up if you like. You can see me, so I can see where's me. Oh, you have the video on. Yeah. Oh, you have to, would you want to go and turn my video off there? Yeah. Now, was your microphone on? Yeah, you can okay. speak. Hi, can can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, well, sorry about that, guys. Uh, okay, I'm going to resume where I think uh, we lost the uh, the connection I think I went already uh, through these slides okay so um, there are three types of uh, uh, the ventilator waveforms can be divided into scalar waveforms and the loops now the scalar waveforms are basically three uh, pressure flow and volume the three of them are plotted against uh, time and the loops the two that we use are uh, pressure volume loops and volume uh, flow uh, loops so here's an example of uh, a screenshot of a ventilator showing uh, the three uh, waveforms. On the top, uh, you have pressure that usually is measured as centimeter water. In the middle, you have flow measured in liters per minute. And on the bottom, you have volume measured in uh, mLs. And as you can see, most uh, ventilators will display uh, inspiration and expiration in different colors. In this case, inspiration is displayed in red and uh, expiration is uh, displays, display in blue. The important thing when you, uh, when you look at these uh, waveforms is that you need to be sure that you're seeing the top and the bottom of each uh, waveform. So you, have to, you may need to adjust the scale to be sure that you're, you're seeing the entire uh, waveform on the, uh, on, the th on the three waveforms. Here is uh, uh, an example of a pressure time uh, waveform. Uh, the waveform, as you can see, does not start from baseline, starts from PEEP. In this case, is uh, whatever PEEP you set at. But that's where the baseline of the pressure waveform will, will begin. Uh, there is an increased uh, pressure with inspiration, as you can see here in red followed by a, a peak inspiratory pressure and followed by expiration. Anything that is between the beginning of the initial increase in pressure till the PIP is considered inspiration and anything from the PIP to the beginning of the next uh, breath will consider, be considered expiratory time. So the pressure time waveform is not in my criteria the most important one, that is not the most useful one. Uh, it shows uh, air pressure, uh, it shows uh, breath timing, breath type deliver, and patient versus uh, machine trigger. 
<laughs> Unfortunately, I lost my uh, my uh, animations with this. But anyway, so uh, the pressure time waveform will be different according to the type of ventilator you are using. If you're using volume ventilation, the shape of that pressure uh, time waveform will be sinusoidal because pressure is not the uh, the the determining factor in volume ventilation is volume okay however when you're using pressure ventilation uh, the pressure waveform will be very regular will be square or boxy okay because that determine the, the 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 parameter the machine is using to ventilate which is pressure okay so remember during volume ventilation the the pressure is secondary to the change in volume during pressure ventilation, the, pri the pressure is the primary uh, element that the ventilator will use, and that's why the pressure waveform is always the same and is always regular and takes the shape of a, of a box, of a square. Okay, uh, I have a question for you. I'll give you 10 seconds to uh, answer. So these waveforms are typical of what type of ventilation? Uh, one, pressure control ventilation. Two, volume control ventilation. Three, spontaneous breathing. So 10 seconds and then we'll uh, give you the right answer. Uh, you can see the poll in your screen. Can you please look at the poll and answer? Okay, uh, good. I think we got the uh, the answers. Uh, very good. So the correct answer is one. This is pressure control ventilation. The reason we know is pressure control is because, as you can see, the pressure waveform is square. Uh, and the um, the flow and the volume are, are not. So uh, the control variable on this mode of ventilation is pressure. And that's why it's, it's square. OK, very good. So one of the most important waveform, at least to me, uh, is the flow, flow time waveform. Okay, uh, the flow time waveform is a bit more complex because it has a positive um, element and a negative element. Anything above the baseline, positive, means uh, flow going into the lungs. Anything on the bottom going negative is flow that goes away from the lungs. So this flow time one form has a, an inspiratory flow that has two components. One is the uh, uh, accelerating inspiratory flow, the initial inspiratory flow that the machine will deliver to try to achieve uh, the volume or the pressure depends what type of ventilator you're using and then as the lungs start expanding and, and filling with air the flow will start slowing down and that's the decelerating inspiratory flow. The same with expiration the initial part of expiration is very fast as the pressure between the alveoli and the atmospheric is greatest so the flow will the air will leave the lungs very fast and as the two pressures uh, start equalizing then the flow will start slowing down and then you have a decelerating expiratory flow that will ideally reach uh, baseline again. Okay, so anything below the baseline is expiratory flow, anything above is uh, inspiratory flow. Now, uh, the inspiratory flow is going to be dependent on the type of ventilator you use. It's going to be different for volume control, it's going to be different for uh, pressure control and it's also going to be different for pressure assisted ventilation. However, the expiratory flow is equal for all the type of ventilators you're using because it does not depend on the ventilator but it's basically is a, a passive uh, expiratory flow that depends mostly in the resistance and the compliance of the lungs and the system. Okay. So uh, here we have an example of the flow time waveform during volume control ventilation. As you can see here, the, uh, the flow is constant. Okay? It's a typical uh, feature of volume control ventilation. There are also ventilators uh, using volume control that also has a descending flow. 
but again, the flow is going to be very regular, it's always going to be the same, and the volume achieved will be the same. However, the pressure waveform, as you can see here, will be sinusoidal, it's not square. And as you can see, this pressure form has two peaks. One is the, the highest peak, which is represent the PIP, and then as soon as the flow terminates, that pressure goes down a little bit and it forms the plateau pressure. The reason for the difference here is because the initial PIP includes airway resistance. As soon as flow stops, and there's no flow coming in, that airway resistance will disappear and you only end up with the pressure in the alveoli. Okay? And that's the, the two things that we use to determine dynamic compliance and static compliance. Doing dynamic compliance, you calculate PIP uh, minus PIP. You include not only compliance of the alveoli, but you also include the compliance of airway. During the plateau, during the static compliance, you only compare the plateau uh, pressure, which is basically the, uh, the alveolar uh, compliance without taking into account uh, resistance. So this is uh, another example now on the flow time waveform on the pressure control. And as you can see here, whoop, sorry, the, uh, there is a, the flow is decelerating, which is a typical feature of a pressure control, and the pressure now, it turns the form of a square of a box, because that's the, uh, the criteria the machine is using to uh, deliver its pressure. Okay? The flow is secondary. So again, we have uh, two uh, other examples of uh, display of uh, flow wave during pressure target ventilation. As you can see here, the flow during pressure is descending. Okay? The flow wave during volume target ventilation is more square. Okay? It's constant. Okay, uh, the flow waveform is important to uh, adjust and uh, control your inspiratory time. Uh, we know that uh, uh, adjusting inspiratory time is, is important. Um, it will affect how much volume you deliver to the lungs. It will also affect the mineral pressure because uh, inspiratory time is part, is, part, is part of your uh, mineral pressure formula. Okay? So it will be important to determine what's the right inspiratory time that you need to use. So here we have on the top we have flow, on the bottom we have pressure. Uh, when the TI is too short, like here, you can see that the inspiratory flow does not reach a uh, baseline when the expiratory flow uh, begins. So expiration begins before the, the inspiratory flow reaches baseline. The problem with that is that you did not have enough flow, therefore your PIP was not achieved. Okay? So you end up with lower PIP than you expected. Okay? Uh, I guess the... the uh, Okay, so unfortunately the, uh, the animation is not working here. Uh, I'm going to try to explain here. So when the, uh, the inspiratory time is adequate, your inspiratory flow should reach baseline and it has, should have a very, very tiny uh, pause before the expiratory time uh, begins. Okay, and uh, if that's correct, then you should be able to achieve your, your PIP. However, when your TI is too long, uh, two things will happen. First, you're going to end up with a long plateau, a long plateau in your pressure. So your pressure will be achieved, but it will be a long plateau. The, the pressure will stay uh, the same for the duration of the inspiratory time without getting uh, extra volume into the lungs. And the other problem is when you have a longer inspiratory time, your expiratory time will get shorter. Okay, And when that happens, then you may end up with what we call air trapping or auto peep, in which there is not enough time for the expiratory flow to reach a uh, baseline before the next um, inspiratory flow starts. Unfortunately, uh, animation is not working and I can't show you that, okay? So, uh, this one again, uh, it's, it's supposed to have an animation showing the difference uh, when you increase the inspiratory time. I'll try to explain and see if you can understand. So here we have uh, a baby that is uh, using an inspiratory time of uh, 0.3 seconds. Uh, the volume is 5.6 mLs per kilo, and the mineral pressure is uh, 8. 
So if you were to uh, double that inspiratory time, let's say from 0.3 to 0.6 seconds, what's going to happen is your mineral pressure definitely is going to go up. It's going to go up to uh, 11 or almost 12. However, you will see that the, the tidal volume will not go up. It will stay at 5.6. Why? Because the baby needs only a TI of 0.3 seconds to deliver the, uh, the pressure and the volume that you set. So any extra inspiratory time, the only thing that will do is having a long plateau, keeping that volume in the lungs much longer, causing over distension without giving uh, an extra Uh, your minimum ventilation is not going to change. Your tidal volume remains the same because there is no more flow. It's just you're keeping the, 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 the volume inside the lungs. And that can cause problems with increased pulmonary vascular resistance. You could end up with decreased cardiac output. You could end up with decreased uh, cerebral blood flow and uh, uh, decreased uh, cerebral blood uh, uh, venous return and that can cause significant issues. So it's important to look at the waveform and see at, at what point your inspiratory flow reaches baseline, and that should be very close to the, the, the desired inspiratory time. This is an example of uh, what I explained before. Uh, the, blow, the flow wave showing uh, increased expiratory resistance and gas trapping. As you can see here in blue, you have inspiration. On yellow, the dotted line is supposed to be the normal um, flow reaching baseline, but as you see here in the solid line, this yellow one here does not completely reach baseline before the next breath starts. So this point here, this extra pressure that accumulates in the lungs is called out of peep or air trapping. Okay? So when expiratory flow does not return to baseline and inspiration starts before expiration ends, you end up with air trapping or out of peep. Okay, here is a display, the same thing. Uh, you can see here the blue line does not fully reach baseline before the red line, which is the inspiratory flow, starts. So the decelerating expiratory link fails to reach baseline before next breath uh, begins, preventing complete emptying of the lungs. Okay, the third waveform is, is volume. Uh, the volume waveform um, is very similar to the pressure waveform. The main difference is that, again, it depends uh, the shape of that uh, volume uh, waveform, depends on the type of ventilator you're using, and also uh, the volume waveform starts from zero. Doesn't start from the peep, start from zero. zero, zero volume, okay? And it should end at zero volume. So the, the inspiratory volume and the expiratory volume should be equal, should be the same. Okay? And as you can see here on the, on the left side, during volume control, usually you get a, a, a small a plateau because that's the, um, the parameter that the ventilator is using. And during spontaneous breathing and the pressure support is more pointy because you don't have a, usually a plateau in volume unless your inspiratory time is, is too long. So here's an example what the volume waveform can show you. As you can see here, the volume or expiration goes below the baseline. Okay, this is not good, meaning that the baby is having an active exhalation. Okay, so basically you are losing FRC. If the baseline is FRC, the baby is uh, actively exhalating and losing lung volume on expiration. And they could be due to uh, many things, uh, maybe agitation or other things that could trigger this active exhalation. This is uh, uh, the opposite now. Uh, you can see now that the uh, the expiratory part of that uh, volume time uh, waveform does not reach baseline. So there's a space here. So this tells you that the expiratory volume is less than the inspiratory volume. Okay. Now this could be due to two things. This could be due to uh, an air leak or it could also be due to air trapping and auto peep. Now you can't really tell which one is the, is the problem with the volume waveform, if it's auto peep or if it's uh, air leak. For that, you need to refer to your flow uh, waveform and also to the flow volume loop. And those will tell you if it's an air leak or if it's uh, air trapping. Okay? But with the volume waveform, you can't really tell. All you can tell is that there is a, a less expiratory volume than inspiratory volume. 
Okay, so uh, again, putting everything together here, on the left side, we have the three wave form during volume support. As you can see, the sinusoidal shape of the pressure uh, wave form, the square uh, uh, flow with a plateau, and the, the volume. On the right side, we have the pressure support in which the plateau now occurs during pressure. Okay, the pressure wave form now is square for boxy, and the flow takes the shape of a decelerating uh, flow. Okay, so um, this is basically the same thing. Uh, this, unfortunately, I guess I lost your animation, my animations. This is an example of volume uh, ventilation. Why I know that is because your flow here is square, as you can see here, and your volume is constant. See, every single breath has the same volume because that's the parameter that the machine is using. However, you can see the pressure waveform is irregular. So you have a small one, a bigger one here, a smaller one here, because the pressure is secondary to the compliance. So the volume could be the same, but the pressure triggered by that volume will be different according to the compliance of that, of that lung with each, each breath. So the pressure waveform will be variable. Okay? However, when you look at the, uh, the waveform during pressure control, now, first of all, you can see now that the pressure is constant. Every single breath is the same. This pressure waveform is square, and now the flow is decelerating. And again, now what is changing now is the volume. The volume now is, is irregular. So you have a small volume here, a large volume here, a small one here, because now the volume delivered for that pressure will be secondary to the compliance of that lung. So if the compliance is, is very low, your um, your pressure uh, will be achieved faster, and so you get less volume. If your compliance is is normal or, or high, then you're going to get a lot of volume into the lungs with the same pressure. Now, let's talk about the pressure volume loops. And again, this is one of the most important uh, uh, graphics that you can uh, obtain from your machine. Um, the, the loop, I'm going to describe this as you need to know the familiar with four points on this uh, loop. The first one is the starting point, which is right here. As you can see, this point does not start at, at zero pressure, start at a pressure that is equal to the PEEP. So that's the beginning. And also, if it's all positive, if the beginning is positive, meaning that is the, the breath is triggered by the machine 100%, but if the initial pressure is negative and it goes in the opposite direction means that the that breath was triggered by the by the patient okay the second point is what we call the lower inflection point which is the minimal pressure required for alveolar recruitment so all this pressure here is was used just to uh, recruit alveoli and overcome airway resistance so ideally you don't want to have this lower inflection point ideally you want to have a very smooth transition from this point all the way up, all the way down. When you see a transition point here, it means that your PEEP may be too low, okay? You're basically ventilating the lungs in this part of the curve, which is very low compliance, in which you need a lot of pressure to get very little change in volume, okay? After that point, when the lungs open, then you see the compliance curve goes up, okay? Meaning that the compliance is good, and this is where you wanna be, because here you obtain a lot of volume for less change in pressure. Okay? until you get to this point, which is the beaking over the extension point. And again, as you can see here, the, the, the compliance will flatten again. Okay? This means that at this point, you're over distending the lungs. You are getting a lot of, you need a lot of pressure to basically move no, no air inside the lungs. So ideally, you want to terminate your loop, your breath right here. You don't want to go beyond that. Okay? So this part here, it's the peak imperatory pressure. And this right here, this is the tidal volume achieved with that breath, okay? So this is the inspiratory loop, and this is the expiratory limb of that uh, uh, pressure volume loop. On the expiratory limb, first of all, you see another point here, which is called the upper inflection point. Again, what you see a sudden drop in volume, okay? And if you see a significant change in, uh, in the direction of that limb, means that your pressure here is, is the, your PEEP, your distending pressure may not be appropriate and you're losing lung volume, okay? The other important things in this pressure volume loop is that the inspiratory limb and the expiratory limbs are not together, are not the same. 
the inspiratory limb usually is on the right side and explain that the compliance of the uh, the lungs during inspiration is less than during expiration and that's because of the effect of surfactant okay surfactant will actually works uh, work during expiration to improve the compliance of the lungs as the lung volume decreases so if these two limbs are too close together it could mean two things it could mean that you don't have enough flow and the flow um, uh, anger and uh, you may have surfactant deficiency okay so when uh, when you see a little separation between the two lines your flow may not be appropriate and you may have surfactant deficiency okay so on this next slide now I'm going to skip this one uh, so the pressure volume loop uh, is used mostly to detect uh, lung over distension uh, airway obstruction um, that's another thing when the when the two uh, limbs the inspiratory and the expiratory limbs are at too wide apart means that the resistance is too too high and that could be due because the inspiratory resistance is too large and that will will increase the uh, the shape or increase the um, how wide the inspiratory limb is or it could be an increase in airway resistant uh, expiratory resistance which means that the the expiratory limb will be uh, very wide okay or could be both uh, you can also look at the bronco uh, dilator response if you uh, if you give a bronchodilator and see if the separation of the two uh, inspiratory and expiratory limbs will will get together, uh, you can look at the angle of that uh, compliance curve. The ideally uh, you want to see the compliance curve have an angle about 45 degrees or slightly more than that. Okay, so the flatter the 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 loop is means that the lower the compliance. You need more pressure. To get volume inside the lungs, okay, uh, and then you can assess change in your in your ventilator settings and see how that uh, compliance curve will move up or down. Okay, you can also assess work of breathing to see how much separation you have between the inspiratory and expiratory limb. Uh, you can look at flow starvation. As I said, we'll we'll show you an example uh, after. Uh, you can look at leaks and you can also look at triggering efforts. So this is an example of over distension, uh, and this is what we use to uh, uh, objectively uh, measure over distension. And we look at the compliance, the last 20% of that loop, which is the C20, or the compliance of the last 20% of that loop, compared with the compliance of the entire loop. Okay, uh, as you can see here, if if you have no no peak, no peak the big will be basically one solid line it will not be a difference between the compliance at the top and the compliance at the bottom so ideally you want your ratio c20 over uh, uh, dynamic compliance to be close to one so every time your c20 over uh, c dynamic is less than 0.8 means that the top part of that compliance curve is significantly lower than the rest of the compliant curve and then you may um, be dealing with uh, over distension and, and BK. Okay. Uh, I have another question for you. Um, look at this pressure volume loop and uh, you tell me if this is uh, because of an assisted trigger ventilatory breath, this is due to air hunger or this is a spontaneous breath and you can't uh, give me uh, your answers. I'll give you 10 seconds. Okay, should I end the poll? Maybe I will. Okay. Uh, the right answer is uh, three. This is a spontaneous breath. Okay. Uh, why do I know this is a spontaneous breath? Well, because when you look at the inspiration, the inspiration is negative. It's not positive. Okay. So the entire inspiration is negative, meaning that the baby is, is uh, breathing spontaneously, and the way that the air is going to land is by creating a negative pressure inside the alveoli that is lower than the atmospheric pressure. And that's why instead of going this way, as the machine delivers positive pressure ventilation is negative so inspiration now is on the left side and is negative and only 
uh, pressure will become positive during expiration. Okay, so the correct answer this is spontaneous, spontaneous breath. I have another question for you here. Uh, similar uh, volume uh, pressure loop. Uh, the three options are the same. One is this a spontaneous breath. Two is this air hunger, or three is this an assisted trigger breath? And you can you can vote. Okay, and the correct answer is uh, three. This is an assisted trigger breath. The reason I know that is because uh, you can see here that the, uh, the initial change in pressure goes on the opposite direction. Okay, the inspiration doesn't go up right away, but it goes negative. Okay, so this breath is triggered by the, the baby. It's not completely a spontaneous breath because it becomes positive again. So this is a breath that was triggered by the baby but it was assisted by the ventilator, okay? And this is what we call the fishtail, okay? When you see this, this small fishtail here, it means that the breath was triggered by the, uh, by the, by the, by the infant, okay? Uh, this fishtail, this little tail here, should not be too big. If it's too big, it mean, means that the baby is making too much effort, uh, and maybe because the triggering is, is not appropriate or you don't have enough flow, and that's why this uh, loop here could become quite large, and you have to you have to look at that. Okay, so it should be a small fish tail that triggers every single breath. That's you what you want to see. Okay, so here we have an, an example of a uh, uh, pressure volume loop, and uh, uh, what can it show us? So you can see on the left side here we have a loop that is lying down. See the initial part here. The first part of the inspiration is basically achieving no change in volume. You have significant change in pressure and no volume is going into the lungs until you reach this lower inflection point and then all of a sudden the, the, the volume starts going into the lungs. Okay? So the problem with this is your PEEP is too low. Okay? By adjusting the PEEP from here to here, you basically start, you start your loop with the lungs already open and that's what you see here. As soon as the PEEP was increased to this level, now the loop becomes significantly better and, uh, and, and loses that initial uh, flat portion. Okay? This is another example now of uh, the opposite when you have over distension at the top. Okay? As you can see here, you can see this flat part here that refers to uh, uh, over distension. If you were to measure the C20 over the total compliance, you will see that the ratio is, is significantly low. It's less than 0.8. So here you need to uh, deal with this. This can cause problem. Uh, so you need to most likely decrease, decrease your volume to avoid this over distension. Okay, this is another example of uh, what could be seen wrong in the pressure volume loop. As you can see here, the volume uh, the inspiratory limb is not exactly the same as the expiratory limb. Okay, something is lost here. You, you're losing some volume here. So this is most likely related to an air leak. Okay, so and the most common uh, place for an air leak is endotracheal tube. Okay, so every time you see the expiratory limb in the pressure volume limb not reaching uh, baseline, you're dealing with a leak. Okay, this is an example of. Uh, um, uh, an abnormal uh, pressure volume loop. Uh, the, as you can see the, here, the, uh, not only the uh, hysteresis, which is the difference between the inspiratory and expiratory limb is too narrow, but you have an inverted uh, loop here, mean that the baby is really struggling to get an extra breath here. So the top part of this curve is, is done by the baby. Okay? That's why the inspiratory is more negative than expiratory. And this is usually due to uh, air hunger. So you, you have no, you have you don't have enough flow here, and you need to increase your flow to be able to fix this. Now, let's go to the last uh, of the, uh, the graphics, uh, the flow volume loop. The flow volume loop uh, relates uh, flow on the vertical axis against volume on the um, uh, horizontal axis. The 
most important thing that you obtain from the volume uh, f uh, flow loop is resistant to gas flow, which is basically equal to airway resistance. Okay, so you need to look at how much is your peak inspiratory flow. You need to look at how much is your peak expiratory flow, flow, and how much volume you obtain uh, with each each flow. And you also need to see if the inspiratory flow is similar to the expiratory flow. It should be the same, right, as volume. So every time your expiratory volume or flow is not the same as your inspiratory flow, then something is wrong too, okay? So let's look at some examples here. So this is an example of an abnormal flow volume loop because of increased expiratory airway resistance with air traffic. The inspiratory flow is normal. The normal, the peak inspiratory flow is normal. The volume achieved is normal, but you can see here the expiratory flow is quite uh, smaller than before. You end up with a reduced peak expiratory flow, but you also have a scoop out expiratory flow, flow here, so it goes in, okay? And the third thing you see here is this uh, line here does not end at FRC, which should be the same as the baseline, ends lower than that, okay? So we end up with flow that you, you lost you lost flow because the flow does not reach baseline. So this is due to uh, gas trapping because the flow curve does not return to zero uh, uh, line before the next breath. Okay, and this is typical of an increased expiratory airway resistance with air trapping. Another example here is uh, uh, a normal flow volume loop because of restrictive lung disease. The problem here is the lungs are too stiff. You end up with normal uh, uh, peak inspiratory flow and normal peak uh, expiratory flow, but the volume, the significant volume you achieve with that, that flow is significantly uh, reduced, okay? All this volume is lost because the lungs are uh, quite abnormal and restricted, okay? The third example is when you have an air leak. As you can see here, the inspiratory volume is larger than the expiratory uh, flow. This portion here is the volume that you lost during expiration, okay? So this is due to air leak. So the volume during inspiration is larger than the volume on expiration. And this is most likely due to air leak. And you can actually measure how much MLs you lost in volume during expiration. Again, most of the time is because uh, there is a leak through the endotracheal tube. This is an example now of uh, when you have an abnormal flow volume loop, loop due to both intra and extrathoracic fixed obstruction. Okay, as you can see here, this is the form of a uh, cigar shape. Uh, this could be due to either a, a narrow, a very narrow endotracheal tube or a vascular ring. Both inspiration and expiration are limited, so the peak inspiratory and the peak expiratory um, flow are significantly reduced. Uh, so there is flow limitation, but the tidal volume is, is normal. So you have a significantly increased resistance on both inspiration and expiration. The next example now is uh, only restriction to flow on inspiration. When that happens, you, you have to look at uh, extrathoracic fixed obstruction. Okay? The obstruction only occurs during inspiration, and there is no obstruction during expiration. So there is limited inspiratory flow but there's normal expiratory flow rate and normal shape, okay? So the problem here is there is something outside the chest that is causing in significant increase uh, inspiratory uh, flow restriction. Okay, this is another example of an abnormal uh, volume uh, flow loop. Uh, as you can see here, the, uh, the yellow line is supposed to be the normal uh, expiratory flow, but you can see here this, uh, this this line is quite abnormal, quite uneven, uh, it's quite uh, 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 unequal, and this is usually because there's something on the expiratory uh, limb that is causing these changes in flow. The most likely reason for this is either secretions or water in the circuit. When you have secretion, usually you tend to see these abnormalities also in the inspiratory part of the flow, when you only see uh, abnormalities on the expiratory flow, 
most likely is because you have water in the expiratory limb of the circuit. If these abnormalities are seen on the inspiratory uh, flow only, you may have water in the inspiratory limb uh, of, the, uh, of the circuit. So it depends where these abnormalities are, either on inspiration or expiration can give you an idea where the problem is. And if it's on both, most likely it's airway secretions. Okay, this is an, another example of an abnormal um, uh, uh, expiratory uh, airway, but here you don't have a trapping, you only have a decreased peak expiratory flow rate, as you can see here, the yellow line is the normal one, this one is the one that is seen, so you can see there is a difference here, the, ex, the peak inspiratory uh, flow rate is decreased, and also there is a scoop out pattern, okay, but there's no air trapping, so the line ends at FRC. So uh, in this case, uh, it could be due to bronchospasm, and these are the things that you can, these things you can do to see if uh, this obstruction is reversible or not. Uh, you can give a bronchodilator and see how much this expiratory flow will change. If the baby is responsive to bronchodilator, you will see this, this line becoming closer to normal. So another question here, uh, the question is what's going on in here? On the top, you have the volume waveform, and on the bottom, you have the flow volume uh, loop, okay? And I put the red arrows there to show you where the problem is. So is this a leak, is this air trapping, or this is this increased airway resistance? I think we uh, we got we got it right. Yeah. So you are learning fast. Very good. So this is air leak. Okay. Uh, why? Well, uh, definitely the expiratory limb does not reach baseline. Those something was lost during expiration here. And on the flow volume curve, you see that the volume on expiration is significantly less than the volume on inspiration. So this volume loss here is most likely due to an air leak. Okay, again, uh, another question here. Uh, so on the top you have the flow uh, display, volume versus time, and on the bottom you have flow over uh, volume loop. So the options are air leak, air trapping, or increased air resistance. Okay, so the right answer is air trapping. Remember, every time the expiratory uh, flow does not reach baseline, you're dealing with air trapping, okay? And that's reflected also on the flow volume loop. Here, the, the flow on expiration does not reach FRC, does not reach the baseline, and that's here. So all this difference here is air trapping, out of peak, okay? So uh, the right question is air trapping. This is another example of air leak showing uh, three different things. Uh, the volume waveform does not go back to baseline. I guess if you look at this, you can't tell if this is air trapping or uh, a leak, but then you look at the PV loop in which the expiratory limb does not reach baseline and the flow volume loop, you end up with less volume on, uh, on expiration and this reflects uh, an air leak. Okay, so you lost uh, volume during expiration. Okay, auto peep gas trapping. Uh, again, just to re review everything, is the presence of positive pressure in the lungs at the end of exhalation due to air trapping. There are different causes for this. It could be because your expiratory time is too short. There is no enough time for the expiratory flow to reach baseline. It could be because uh, your expiratory time is is fine, but you have increased airway uh, expiratory resistance or you could also have an early collapse of unstable airway. And you see the way to diagnose air trapping is you look at the flow, 
And again, the expiratory flow does not reach baseline before the next inspiratory breath begins. The volume waveform does not go back to baseline before the next, next breath starts. And when you look at the flow volume uh, loop, the expiratory flow does not end at the baseline, ends below, means that all this extra here, this is due to uh, auto peep and air trapping. Okay, so the flow does not return to baseline. So, in conclusions, uh, real-time pulmonary graphics are the visual representation of the breath-to-breath -breath interaction between the ventilator and the infant. Uh, comprehending pulmonary graphics enables a better understanding of respiratory physiology. The use of pulmonary graphics is critical in understanding both the ventilatory support used and its effectiveness. And the use of pulmonary graphics could anticipate and understand problems related to mechanical ventilation. And again, sorry for all the technical uh, difficulties uh, we had today. And unfortunately, some of the animation did not work. So hopefully, it Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Are you online? No, I, I received okay. some questions uh, already. I, I, if you want thank me to go through the questions. Yes. Thank you, Ruben. It was a wonderful presentation. And uh, as we have sent out the questions uh, in the registration uh, page, we have received questions. And um, Ruben, if you can um, answer the questions, what you have received from the registration, that will be thank you. Yeah. One of the, one of the questions referred to the uh, what type of sensor is the best for, uh, for newborns. Uh, there are basically three types of sensors. Uh, one is flow, one is pressure, and the other one, the, the newer one, is NAVA, which is the diaphragm uh, electromyography. And each one of these sensors have pros and cons. Okay? Uh, the advantage of the, the flow sensors are they uh, have a very quick response, uh, they're very sensitive, and they're non-invasive. Okay? The disadvantages of the flow sensor is that they are affected by leaks, and they add extra dead space and weight. The pressure uh, sensors are good because they don't add uh, extra uh, dead space or weight, and they're also not invasive. But they have a longer um, uh, trigger delay, and the sensitivity is not as good as the flow sensor. Okay, so they're usually not used much uh, in uh, neonatal ventilators. The third one, which is the newest one, is NAVA. Okay. Uh, NAVA is definitely the one that has the fastest uh, response time. It's extremely um, accurate and very, very sensitive. The problem with NAVA is it's new, uh, it's costly, expensive, and uh, it's invasive. And also, it's difficult to position the probe uh, correctly. So those are things that, uh, that uh, make it better with time as the NAVA becomes more, more familiar. But uh, I would say most of the needle ventilators now uh, use uh, flow. Okay. Uh, another question that uh, people ask is, uh, can you please highlight examples of various uh, asynchronies as well as their resolutions? Um, so one of the most common type of asynchrony is, is inappropriate uh, trigger when your trigger sensitivity is too low or when the infant is trying to take a breath during the expiratory phase of the ventilator, uh, either because the TI they're using is, is too short uh, or and the VT and the flow are too low. Okay? Uh, another type of asynchrony is what we call the auto-triggering, when, the, uh, when there's usually condensation or airway secretions or, or coughing, the machine will believe that is the baby trying to trigger a breath, but it's not. It's just noise in the circuit. Okay. Uh, the third one is, uh, is what we call ineffective triggering, is when the ventilator doesn't sense the patient respiratory effort. Okay. And uh, this could be due to weakness, uh, weaknesses from the baby. The baby is not strong enough to, uh, to uh, provide a, a good uh, a breath. 
Uh, it could be due to auto peep. When you have auto peep, uh, the baby needs to trigger, um, have to develop a, a greater pressure to be able to overcome that uh, that auto peep, and that sometimes is not sensed by the uh, by the ventilator. Or it could be due to the sensitivity that the trigger sensitivity is is too high, and that's why the ventilator is not sensing that uh, spontaneous breath. Um, each of these causes of asynchrony uh, has different solutions. I, I, I don't have time to go through uh, each one of them. But the important thing is to make the correct diagnosis, uh, looking at the pulmonary graphics, uh, looking at the work of breathing, uh, looking at the res respiratory rate, etc., and act uh, accordingly to, to try to fix the problem. Uh, the third question, and maybe this is the last one we can address because of the for time, is uh, how to calculate uh, optimal inspiratory time using ventilatory ventilator graphics, uh, time constant, and how TI varies with prematurity. Well, I think I already addressed uh, some of these uh, uh, issues with the inspiratory time and presentation, uh, but the TI has to be sufficient for the pressure to rise to the PIP, to the peak inspiratory pressure, and form a, a short uh, plateau. Okay? If the TI is too short, the PIP will not be achieved, and therefore uh, a low tidal volume uh, will occur if you're using uh, volume targeted uh, ventilation. If the TI is too long, you're going to see a long plateau with no extra volume delivered so no extra line recruitment, and it will be uh, a, a flat flow on inspiration for a, a longer time. Um, in relationship to uh, time constant, remember that in premature babies with RDS uh, and dealing with pathologies that have homogeneous Lyme disease, the time constant is usually very short, and your inspiratory time should be short. Uh, in most uh, small babies where the S, uh, you can get away with a TI of 0.3 seconds or even less. And if you look at your flow, uh, sometimes you realize that you can get away with a TI that is you know, 0.27 or 0.28. Okay? And uh, try to minimize the TI because anything extra is basically wasted. Okay? Um, as the baby becomes older or you are dealing with different pathologies like uh, meconium aspiration or a baby that is developing BPD, now the Airway resistance is changing, is going up, and therefore your time constant is going to increase. In those babies, your inspiratory time uh, will have to be longer. And again, you have to look at the uh, uh, the flow away from to be sure that uh, and the volume to be sure that you are delivering the volume or the pressure you are setting. But also you need to look at the the flow expiratory uh, part to be sure that the expiration, the expiratory flow reaches baseline. Because when you have a longer uh, time constant, you need longer time to empty the lungs. So you need to be sure that your flow uh, waveform uh, goes back to baseline before the next breath uh, starts. So um, I, don't, I, th I don't think we have, unfortunately, time for more, more questions. Uh, I guess we lost time at the beginning. But um, yeah, I don't know. Um, Gani, what do you think? No, it's uh, six minutes past three. Um, so thank you, Ruben. As usual, it is a great presentation. We really enjoyed and learned a lot from you. And um, we are extremely sorry for the technical issues what um, we experienced. Uh, we will be sending a full video link uh, with all the animations which is working and for everyone can watch later and that will be done as soon as possible. Thank you, everyone. And I take this opportunity to thank uh, um, everyone's interest. We had more than 600 or around 650 uh, participants in this session. And uh, because of uh, the large uh, volume that we need to move the um, a portal, and we had some errors uh, in this uh, portal too. So I want to take this opportunity to announce um, <clears throat> what is um, our new uh, innovative workshop that what we are planning and I want you to say the dates uh, this is an advanced hemodynamic e-conference and e-workshop uh, which is uh, scheduled on August 15 and 16 and 22 and 23 so 15 and 16 in e-conference and the 22 and 23 is the e-workshop 
more details we, we, we will be sending you and also will be posting on our website uh, in two weeks time um, please uh, uh, look at your inboxes and also you know uh, look at the website uh, for more information and uh, there are much more um, uh, educational sessions to follow Thank you everyone for your uh, time and, uh, and again we are sorry for the technical errors and see you again uh, next week. Thank you. Thank you Rupan. Thank you.